Hello folks! Okay, this time I want to talk a little bit about internationalization and localization of our software. So the idea is we want to be able to use our product in lots of different regions with lots of different languages, lots of different alphabets, lots of different currencies, lots of different time zones. So in order to do that effectively, we have to plan for it well in advance. So I want to get into uh, some of the details we'll have to think about. I, again, we want to structure our programs in a way that's going to make this easy, as opposed to trying to retrofit something later on. And we'll get into some of the gory details in a little bit. So usually the idea is that internationalization is the design so that we're going to be able to do this when we want to, and then localization is the idea of actually going through and saying, okay, now I want to add the actual content and support for a specific region or a specific language. So again, this can, in, can include a lot of different things, right? We've got to have a suitable alphabet, suitable symbols, um, the right uh, pictures and diagrams for a particular region, uh, the right language translation, the right level of formality or informality, uh, suitable choice of colors, currencies, dates, all sorts of different things have to be considered when you're going to do this. So again, to do this well, we've got to be thinking of, of it from early in the design process. Your interface can't be sort of custom built with just one language or one region in mind, you have to think about how that interface is going to work for all the different kinds of images you might have to put in the different places and the different text that you might have to put in different places. Um, if you're thinking in terms of just the prompts or headings that appear someplace, those can take a different amount of space depending on what language you're representing them in. Right? If you pick a certain size font, and you write some statement in English versus German versus Japanese versus, you know, pick your favorite language, it's going to take different amounts of space. And you have to think about that and what that's going to make your interface look like for all of the different languages you want to represent. So this is all stuff that you need to be thinking about and you're going to need to have people with the right background to go through and help you do this design and make sure that it's appropriate for all of the regions you want to support. And it also means that you actually have to test it across all of the different regions and languages and whatnot that you want to try and support. So there is a lot more going on here that we have to try and consider. Um, when you're thinking in terms of uh, the images and the text and things that you want to insert in places, you know, say you've got prompts that you want to appear in different places or messages that you want to appear in different places. Right? Often when we're doing our, our coding in sort of first and second year, we actually stick in a statement, you know, print out this line of text here. Well now, if that line of text has to appear in different languages, then maybe what we want to do is say, okay, here's the message that I want to appear and have an ID for it. And here's the language I want it written in and have an ID for that and basically call something that says, okay, write the message with ID whatever in the language with ID whatever now. All right, so you, maybe you've got a giant table someplace of all of the different kinds of messages that you can wind up writing and all of the different languages that they have to be written in, right? So that it can make sure that the right text appears in the right language using the right alphabet in the right spot. So again, it just requires a little more forethought when you're going through the design process. So different languages provide different degrees of support for this. Uh, maybe we'll take just a little side trip here. I'm not going to get into the gory details because there is so much depth to this, but, uh, but I want to introduce a couple of the ideas um, there are things like the locale library in uh, C or C++ that contain a number of different settings for things like time and currency and whatnot. So maybe we'll just take a, a quick little boo at um, some of this and have a quick play. So am I in the right place here? Let's take a look in locale. And so what we've got here 
is just a really simple C++ program in which we'll play with a couple of the, lo the locale settings. So first off, we're going to look up the default locale settings for our program right now. So this locale method in the locale library, right, we'll say go off, please look up just whatever the defaults are right now, store it in our locale object, and then we'll go through and use that to look up different aspects. So you can specify what uh, facet of the locale you want to look at. So let's say I want to be able to look up what kind of punctuation, what kind of symbols are in use for the currency right now. So there is a facet for money punctuation that we can go off and look up. So again, the syntax gets rather gory and ugly. You can see that we've got lots of templates and stuff going on, lots of typecasting going on here. So this is a matter of go in and dig into the, the reference material to find the right settings that you want to look up, what facet you want to look up, and what aspect of it. And here we're just saying, okay, I want to look up what kind of currency punctuation is in use for the current locale. And then once we've got that, I'm going to go through and say, okay, let's just look up the name of the currency, the symbol that we're using right now. So hopefully this is going to go off and find the dollar sign or whatever it is by default right now. So again, it's a matter of being able to go through, find the settings that we want, and be able to look them up appropriately. Um, similarly, to take kind of a different, oops, ah, take kind of a slightly different approach in the second part here, we're actually going to specify what uh, what locale we want to use. So I'm going to say as far as the monetary aspects go, I want to use um, English US dollars, for instance. So you find out what the appropriate uh, string is and say, okay, please go off and uh, get the current locale object. And this is just another way of going off and doing that and looking up the currency symbol that we're using for that object. All right, so here we're setting the locale instead of just looking up what the defaults are. And then based on that, we're going off and finding out what our currency string is. So hopefully, uh, if we give this a try, it's going to go off and say, okay, well, again, that first part where we're just looking up the defaults, so I guess we set our, <laughs> when we reset it, we set it to the same thing as that. So we look at the default money symbol in use, and I think I've got a glitch in there, but we get our currency symbol back. So you can go off and play with this stuff. Again, the um, there's an incredible depth to what you can do with locale. This is just kind of giving you the idea. So I will let you play with that as your heart desires. Just be aware that this is something that we can do and something we should be considering. And again, a lot of different programming languages provide us with different degrees of support for the use of things like this. So that's one of the kind of broad areas looking at different aspects of it. Um, what I want to do is spend a little bit of time playing just specifically with language and alphabets. Right? What set of symbols are we actually going to try and be able to support in the text that our program uses? So for the most part in playing with uh, C++ to this point we've just used the regular old char character which uses an ASCII encoding, which means that there's 128 possible characters you can support, and each of them has a fixed integer code that's associated with it. And you can look up the ASCII table and see, okay, you know, the, the character A has integer value whatever associated with it, the character space has integer value, I think it's 32 associated with it. So each of the values from 0 to 127 is associated specifically with one character for a char. And um, EBCDIC is another alternate encoding that uses the same basic idea. You've got 256 possible values from 0 to 255. Each of them is associated with a specific character. And for the most part, these are based on the kind of QWERTY keyboard, um, just using English and the common punctuation symbols supported in North America, and not really a whole lot else. And so if you want to represent symbols in other languages, or even just symbols in math or anything else, then it's really not supported by the char data type. 
So we need something that'll support a wider range of symbols. So for instance, having a wider range of possible codes and have you know different codes associated with all of the different symbols that are possible in other languages. And just in other areas as well, right? Chemical symbols, math symbols, um, emoticons, whatever it might be. So to do that, you need some kind of an agreement on what codes go with which symbols. And the most commonly used one by far is Unicode. So the idea here is we've got a range of hundreds of thousands, well, potentially an infinite range of possible codes. And different subsets of those have been agreed upon to represent certain alphabets, certain collections of symbols. So you can go off and if you do a quick Google on Unicode charts, you can find lists of um, all of the different symbols that are out there and agreed upon and which codes are associated with them. So these are usually given in hex. So I don't know, let's look at uh, ancient Greek, why not? And it'll go through and, oh, that's a lousy table. That's, there we go. Okay, so it'll give you the hex that you're interested in for a particular symbol. So this symbol is going to have the hex uh, 10140, right? So it's giving the first four characters there and then the last character down the side in this particular case. So you can look up what the hex code is for any given symbol. And again, as you saw, there are a huge range of different symbols supported in you know whatever it is you want to be, a whole slew of different arrow symbols, a whole slew of whatever it is you happen to want. It's just a matter of looking up wherever we are here, right? The right code for the right symbol that you want to use. So now for charters in C++, they're represented with a single 8-bit byte. So you can only have, you know, 256 possible combinations. Only 127 or 128 of them are actually in use. But there's no way that you can get this full range of symbols represented using a char. So you need a bigger data type, a, a wider data type, something that's got more bytes in it. All right. So again, this is just kind of reiterating what I was saying before, is that for Unicode, we need multiple bytes to represent a character. Uh, in Unicode, there's a whole bunch of different kind of collections of character code sizes. So there's ones that can be represented in one byte that are basically just the ASCII characters again, or two bytes, or four bytes, or six bytes, or eight bytes. And there's special patterns for how those are actually represented behind the scenes, but we're not gonna get into that. But it means that as long as you know the code and you've got a Unicode character, you can represent pretty much any symbol that you want. So again, um, just a few examples of different symbols, right? The 20AC in hex represents this symbol. The 2620 in hex represents this symbol. Again, lots of different possibilities. So different programming languages support Unicode in different ways and to different levels. Um, of course, we'll take a look at a little bit of Bash and a little bit of C++ to represent this. Um, and C++ will be coming back to that locale library. And we'll just have a bit of a play with this to see how it works. So in terms of Bash, um, it is possible to enter uh, Unicode characters directly on the command line. Most editors also allow you to enter Unicode characters into you know, whatever file it is you're editing. Um, so there'll be some kind of sequence that allows you to do this. So for instance, let's see if I can get this working in, uh, um, let me just get in the right directory here. So let's see if I can remember my Vim syntax for this. Um, I believe it was a control V and then we can enter the character. Oh no, pardon me. I'll get there. Oops. Yeah. So we want to insert, then a control V and the Unicode character that we want. So let's try 2620. And then I think we hit escape 
to exit this and it gives us whatever the symbol is for hex 2620. So you can actually go through in you know most editors and as long as you know the sequence of keystrokes to get it you can actually uh, embed your uh, Unicode symbols directly into the file that you're playing with. So that's one possibility. Uh, when we're working in Bash, you can actually use printf's to display Unicode symbols. So as long as you know what the symbol is, so in this case, um, I think 263A is the smiley face if I remember correctly. So to store a Unicode character in Bash, it's the double backslash and a U and then the code for that character. So uh, I believe what I'm doing here is storing the code for a smiley symbol in the variable right. I'm going to get the user to enter something. If what they entered was the word smiley, I'm going to print the smiley face, and otherwise I'm just going to print that they got it wrong. So hopefully this actually works. Um, yeah. So it tells me to enter something. I enter foo. And it tells me I got it wrong. Um, and if we try it again, and I enter smiley, it compares smiley to the word smiley, and it prints out my little smiley face symbol. So you can actually print Unicode symbols in uh, in Bash relatively easily using printf. So there's uh, one quick example of some of the things we can do. Again, it's just knowing what kind of hoops you have to jump through in your given language to use the Unicode symbols. So again, in C or C++, we can't use char because that only handles you know, ASCII characters, but there are wide chars, wide characters, and wide strings and whatnot. So um, CW char is for wide characters and CWC type and uh, wchar underscore t is the one that we'll actually use and w string for wide strings and these all basically allow you to work with Unicode characters and Unicode strings. And then for most of the IO routines you'll also find that there's a wide string or wide char version of those so wc in to read in um, Unicode strings or wc out to print out Unicode strings. Uh, one thing that you do have to do with text literals is distinguish that what you're doing is using a wide string or a Unicode string, if you like, instead of a regular string. So for the most part, that's done by actually putting the capital L prefix before it. So, you know, if you're assigning the string foo to something, then it's capital L and then your string foo. Now, generally speaking, it's not a good idea to have a program that mixes regular ASCII strings and Unicode strings. It's use one or the other. Do everything in Unicode or do everything in ASCII. So if you want to use Unicode, it's pretty much do everything using your Unicode strings. Um, again, just a small example. Here we'll go through, we'll use our regular IOS3 library, our string library, and again, they have wide string versions within them. Uh, we'll use our C locale. We'll look up the current locale, so our current settings, and then we'll prompt the user, and again, I'm using a Unicode string here, right? So it's got that L prefix in it, a wide string prefix in it. I think that should actually be a W string, but we'll get a, a real example going in just a second here. We use our WC out to print it out. Right here we've got a wide character, right? A W char T, so C is just a wide character, and I'm reading in whatever the user types, the next character the user types. I'm comparing that to the character Q, and again, you note that since this is a literal, I've got that L in front. And I can print out some string or another based on that. So again, if we just want to have a quick play with, uh, what have we got here? Oops. Um, again, what we're going through is using the set locale, look at what we've got. I'm going to create a wide string, right? You notice the W for a, w, a wide string. I'm storing something in it. And again, I've got that L prefix because this is a wide string. I'm printing it out using WC out. Right? I'm creating a character to hold a wide character, a Unicode character, so that's our CH here. 
I'm reading whatever the user types into that, you know, printing out some message saying you entered whatever. Um, here we've got the code where we're actually storing uh, specific Unicode characters. So again, this one's the smiley face, I'm pretty sure. So again, the code for that is 263A. So we're saying, okay, let's store a smiley face in this variable and we'll compare what the user entered with uh, the smiley character and we'll print out one thing or another, right? So we can go through and play with all this stuff in C++ as well. It's just, again, making sure that we look up what the correct syntax is and you know we know what the codes for our desired characters are. We make sure that we remember the difference between just a regular old text string, an ASCII string, and a wide string, and we make sure we stick with that consistently throughout our program. So, I will leave that there and let you folks play with some of this. And we'll pick up with uh, maybe a little bit on interfaces and things next time around.